Hello there, thank you for joining me. This time we're going to have a look at a very interesting kit, the Infinity Models 132nd scale offering of the SP2C Helldiver. Let's see how it does. The release of the Infinity Models 132nd Helldiver kit in late 2021 was interesting in two respects. It's the first injection moulded representation of the type in this scale, bearing in mind that its predecessor, the Dauntless, has been available in 32nd scale since 1978. It's amazing how long it's taken for anyone to kit the beast in the same scale. Secondly, the release comes not from one of the mainstream manufacturers, but as a limited run release from Infinity Models of the Czech Republic. Opening the very full box, over 300 parts are revealed, spread across nine sprues. There's also a small PE fret and another representing the fabric seat belts. Close inspection of the parts showed good surface detail, a mixture of engraved and some raised, which was well done and looked effective. On the other hand, the overall standard of moulding was mediocre. Prominent mould seams were evident on virtually every part and detail was not as sharp as found on most modern mainstream kits. You can see here the decal sheet which is extensive although in the end I didn't use much of it. The very good fabric effect seat belts with etched brass buckles so often missed out from large scale kits but definitely included with this one. Good quality transparencies, nice and clear and crisply moulded, and a good supporting cast. Dead design masks, colour coat paints, MIG weathering and the MRP lacquer all performed well during the course of this build. Construction begins with the front and rear cockpit interiors. It was immediately obvious that a lot of cleaning up would be required before any meaningful assembly could begin and a lot of parts were involved. Many hours of work were necessary to clean everything up and the IPMS seam removing tools had considerable employment being ideal for this sort of work. Once the parts were cleaned up they looked a lot better and some assembly could begin. The fuselage halves were well moulded and detailed but had no locator pins around the edges, common feature of short run kits. There was a number of floor and bulkhead parts to be fixed in place before any painting was attempted and any detail parts fitted. These were a variable fit, some almost perfect and others requiring some reshaping and clamping as you can see here. Detailing the fore and aft cockpit interiors can then continue. One or two points of note begin with the instrument panel. It's a transparent moulding with a grey plastic backing, the dials being represented on a decal that's put on the backing with the transparent panel on top. For this to work, the glass covers on the panel need reaming out with a small drill and a needle file. The panel needs thinning down on a sanding sheet to reduce the depth of the instrument recesses and the panel then painted as normal. The front and rear panels were then attached with the glass faces being represented with a touch of Humbrol clear fix. Fitting all the pre-painted interior parts was a long job, not helped by a general lack of firm locating points. However, the instructions were generally clear about where everything should go. Quite a few data panels are included, represented by decals, which look all right, but need close trimming to remove the fairly extensive carrier film before they're applied. The instructions have the rear gunner's seat, guns and mounting ring assembled and attached at a much later stage, but it's better do this now. It's because the rear cockpit is very crowded with various bits of equipment. Unless it's all positioned carefully, there won't be room for the seat and the guns to be inserted later, so constant checking is necessary now. As it was, the aft end of the bracket holding the ammo boxes, that's part G16, needed shortening by about 3mm to allow sufficient clearance for the ring to be easily inserted later. The gun rail, part F23, has the distinctive lightning holes moulded solid, but their position was clearly enough indicated to make reaming them out quite easy. An important modification is required to the part that mounts the guns to the rail, D52, if this is fitted as per the instructions, which it is in the picture you can see in front of you, the guns will sit too high in the cockpit. 
The part has two vertical rods moulded next to each other with the rear one longer than the front. The rear one needs to be cut away. The remaining shorter one is attached D60 and then to the gun ring. This makes the guns sit lower and largely solves a problem. There's a photo etched gun sight provided which is good but the ends of the barrels will need reaming out to further improve the appearance. Fuselage halves were then mated together. The fit was generally good in terms of absence of any gaps but the alignment was not perfect and join lines were very prominent requiring a lot of attention to get rid of without losing too much surface detail. The engine and cowling were completed next. Cowling components were well moulded, nice and thin and capture the complex shape of the real thing. The prominent joint seams need removing and a touch of filler was required around the edges of the front intake but the finished item looked good. The engine components looked pretty basic at first glance but once they were cleaned up the level of detail was reasonable. They assembled very well up until the point of fitting the four part exhaust manifold. This doesn't fit, not at all, and only a significant amount of cutting, sanding and general reshaping could cure the problem. It would be worth considering leaving the exhaust components off altogether actually. Even through the open cowling gills they're not really visible in the completed model and it would save a lot of work. No ignition leads are represented in the kit so these are included using fine strands of round section rubber. Attaching the leads in the correct firing order is not that difficult as there are plenty of online pictures of the real engine to show how they go. It was a fiddly job but it looked good when it was finished. The wing assembly proved a major chore. Things started off okay as the upper wing halves mated well with the fuselage after a bit of gentle reshaping. However, some problems soon arose. Dry fitting of the lower wing halves showed some alignment issues with the upper halves. Also, fit with the fuselage, although good along most of the cord of the wing, was very poor at the root leading edge. In addition, the rib detail in the upper wing wheelbase didn't match up with the corresponding detail on the spar. If one side lined up correctly, the other didn't. Really, the best solution is to split the spar in its centre and insert a 2mm plastic card strip to lengthen it. The spar in this build was too firmly attached to be easily removed, so a bit of misalignment had to be accepted. The lower wing halves were attached to the upper and the large gap at the leading edge root filled and sanded. The rib detail in the wheelbase should have been added before this was done, but such was the importance of getting the main wing components assembled correctly that the detail parts were inserted into the bay areas after the wings were built. There were 14 ribs to be added to each wheel bay and the fit of most of them was poor. A lot of cutting, sanding, reshaping and filling was required and the task seemed almost endless. It was at this point the main undercarriage was added. This was earlier than indicated by the instructions but was done because the wheelbase contained no obvious points of attachment for the main wheel legs. The individual undercarriage components were identified and after another long seam clean session did look acceptable, especially the main wheel legs. Fitting the undercarriage into the wheelbase is a complex process, not helped at all by vague instructions and poorly fitting parts. A diagram of the completed unit would have saved a lot of time and effort because the engineering does actually work once you've figured out how to do it. The work on the wings was still not complete. The bomb racks and rocket launching points need adding next and as no holes are provided these all need to be drilled individually. The instructions recommend a 1mm drill but a 1.5 gives a better fit. The drilling points are clearly indicated though. The dive flaps were fitted next and again there were some issues. The complex pattern of the perforations on the flaps was a distinctive feature of the SBC4 and the plastic parts just about adequately represent that but some trimming and reshaping was necessary to get them to fit particularly at the wing root. At least though once this is done the tail planes are added and the basic airframe is almost complete. Hooray! The various cockpit transparencies were painted at this stage as several of them need to be fitted to the fuselage before the main paint scheme is applied. 
the parts are nicely moulded and very clear and the hard work of masking all those frame lines is greatly eased by the dead design canopy mask set which worked very well. The other set which provides masks for the wheel wells also proved most useful. The transparency is fitted well with the exception of the windscreen. This did take a long time to get right and care is needed to ensure that it gets aligned correctly. Painting the model is reasonably straightforward. I chose an aircraft from VB83 in the usual three-tone scheme. Uh, the overall coat of Holford's primer revealed quite a few blemishes to be cleaned up. Once these were done, surfaces were rubbed down with a soft polishing cloth and the dark grey pre-shading of the panel lines applied. The top coats, the colour coats, performed well, gave good coverage, no clogging at all. Uh, colour coats suggest various thinners can be used, particularly their own. However, I use cellulose thinners in this instance and they seem to perform perfectly well. A mixture of three parts thinner to two parts paint gave the best results, incidentally. Painting the stars, bars and numerals was all done using the dead design masks. Uh, they went on very well. The only thing to watch is the rear fuselage star and bar where the mask can distort slightly due to the curvature of the fuselage. Other than that, no problem, good results. No masks are provided for the diamond shaped group markings on the tail and upper wing, so it's DIY time for these. They do take some quite careful measuring and cutting to get right. It all takes a long time, indeed the whole job of painting on the markings took a long time, but I was left feeling that it had been worth the trouble. The final bits were added to the model with no problem other than for the undercarriage doors which need to be aligned correctly and carefully and you probably need some photo referencing to do this. The wingtip lights need a bit of pre-colouring before they're fitted. A 1.5mm hole was drilled inside each one where the paint was added to give the impression of a coloured bulb. I thought the trickiest job was going to be the installation of the guns and the gunner's seat but in practice it proved quite straightforward. Then a final coat of Johnson's Clear Mix 50-50 with distilled water was sprayed and the model was done. So at last we have a 1.32nd scale representation of the beast and thanks are due to Infinity Models for producing it. The various complementary products used in the build all performed well one or two shortcuts could have speeded up the process, such as not bothering with the extra engine detailing and using the kit decals instead of painting on the markings. However, it's still not a kit for everyone this. Completing it requires a lot of experience, a lot of time and a lot of love for the subject aircraft. A deficiency in any one of these areas will most likely result in the frustration of an uncompleted project. On the other hand, the very fact that this kit is such a challenge will make it attractive to modellers wishing to show off their skills, and a well-completed model is a certain attention grabber. We all need to stretch ourselves sometime, don't we? So, thank you for joining me. I hope you found the presentation interesting and useful and that you'll feel free to join me again for my next presentation which will be a build of the border models BF 109 G6 in 135th scale. Thank you again and goodbye.